every four months they get they get an examination which is a written examination in english and an oral examination with patients in english real cases ladies and gentlemen welcome to season Four of the Rhinoplasty podcast. I can't believe it's we are into our fourth year already. And our second episode for this season is with the most lovely and inspiring lady who I had the pleasure of speaking to in season one many years ago. And now, uh, welcome, Roxana Cobo. It's so nice to see you again. Yeah, it's very nice to see you, Cam. Yeah, and we're going to hopefully see you in a few weeks' time at this big international meeting. Tell the listeners about it. Okay, so uh, at, at the end of February, we're going to be having our 10th, uh, in, uh, the 10th world meeting of the International Federation of Facial Plastic Surgery Societies. It's amazing. Uh, you know, Cartagena was a venue. Where, where's Cartagena? Cartagena is in the tip of Colombia. Colombia. So it's a city. I mean, Colombia, we're at the tip of South America. Cartagena is this fortress city. Uh, it's a Spanish fortress city. It is it, it is one of the best preserved fortress cities, uh, cities in the world, yeah. which makes it like really special. So Cartagena uh, is located like in the tip of Colombia, uh, over the Atlantic Ocean. So it's warm water. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, as I said, a fortress city. It's an old city, colonial style. Uh, it is beautiful. I mean, because it's got the tropic, you know, it's it's uh, a relaxed, laid back city with the happiness of the Colombians. Yeah. So it's a great a place where people always, everybody from all over the world want to get married in, in Cartagena. Yeah. They want to travel to Cartagena. Um, the main meetings in medicine happen in Cartagena. Wow. And so our world meeting is happening in Cartagena. So if you haven't yet booked your flight to get there, do it. But maybe for those who haven't yet done that, tell them what is the meeting going to involve? Okay. So it's our facial plastic surgery meeting. So it's we're going to have four tracks. We're going to have, uh, and we have four honorary guests. Uh, Dean Toriumi, who is going to be uh, leading uh, the rhinoplasty track with Jose Carlos Neves, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's uh, the president of the European Academy of Facial Plastic Sur uh, Surgery. And then we're going to have Andrew Giacono uh, leading the facelift track. Okay. And then we're going to have Sebastian Cotofana leading the minimally invasive yeah. uh, track. So we're going to have rhinoplasty. We're going to have facelift. We're going to have all of the other facial rejuvenation yeah, procedures. Yeah. Then we're going to have a track on minimally invasive and technologies uh, for the face. So it's like you're going to get the broad, the whole yeah. picture of facial plastics. And we're going to have the leading surgeons from all over the world yeah, yeah. speaking at our meeting. That's awesome. So, you know, for people who like facial plastic surgery, who think they want to do facial plastic surgery, yeah. who work in rhinoplasty, who work, uh, you know, doing facelifts. I mean, this is the place where they want to be uh, at the end of September, so uh, February. So it's February 29th to March 2. And additionally, we're going to have, of course, a very full academic program because yeah. we're going to have four simultaneous rooms. So we're going to have video sessions. We're going to have debates. And the debates I love because, I mean, those are the areas where really we're going to be uh, debating cl uh, key points in facial in the yeah. different areas of facial plastic surgery with the experts. Yeah. And then we're going to have video sessions. So it's going to be a very nice academic program. Uh, the, the, the nice part of this is that we have invited all of our past presidents of the Federation, mm -hmm. and many of them are going to be at the meeting. Uh, so it's going to be a great opportunity of seeing people maybe we haven't seen for many years. Yeah. And then there's obviously, we're in Cartagena. The social program <laughs> is going to be amazing. So if you want to be, I mean, if you're planning on going, bring, bring your dance shoes, okay. bring tennis shoes, bring a bathing suit because, I mean, you're going to be on the beach. So, I mean, there's going to be time for everything. 
That's awesome. So we're going to have a great time. That's awesome. Okay, so I want to ask you, let's change track and, and, and focus on something else. We had the most delightful day yesterday at the wet lab in Verona, busy um, doing cadaver dissections, etc. You are really passionate about teaching and fellows and stuff like that. Tell the listeners a little bit more about that. Okay, so, you know, during the pandemic, uh, listening to all of the, you know, you were like a pioneer, Cam. Mm -hmm. You know, it was amazing because that was your Zoom meetings were what kept us basically, I think, focused and who we were, mm -hmm. uh, what we wanted to do. And it was this suddenly, you know, all of us were at home or if working, you know, it was basically working in things that didn't necessarily have yes. to do with facial plastic surgery. And then suddenly, you know, we had this whole amount of time on our hands you know, that we were like saying, okay, well, let's learn again. Let's yeah, become yeah. students. Yeah. And so during those two years, uh, one of the things that happened to me was that we started exploring, uh, well, in, in Colombia and I think in most of the South American countries, and I don't know about South Africa, but there has always been this great need for knowledge. Yes. And our gold standard has always been the American Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. Yeah. I mean, we look at the American Academy, they have like the most complete programs in education in facial plastic surgery, because it's not only the nose, Absolutely. it's the whole face, yes. it's the reconstructive part. And so um, with the Federation, and I mean, I have been involved with the Federation since it started. So... Uh, with the Federation, we set up uh, the International Fellowship Programs. Yes. And that has been really interesting because these are one-year fellowship programs, as you well know, yeah. where we're basically uh, offering our students, well, the specialists that uh, you know are, are, are taking the fellowship programs, we're offering them a one-year in-depth training program in the field of facial plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. So what we did in Colombia was that I grouped with two other colleagues from Bogota, mm -hmm. and we set up uh, our international fellowship program for facial plastic surgery in Colombia. And how many fellows is that? We take three fellows, basically wow. because we have three training sites. Yeah. And it's really interesting because I teamed up with Jorge Espinosa and Nicolás Heredia, two other facial plastic surgeons. Yeah. They're from Bogota, I'm in Cali. And I, my... My strong point is rhinoplasty, as you well know. Yeah. Then Jorge is basically facial rejuvenation. Yeah. So he's like the deep plane guy. He, yeah, he yeah, does yeah. all of the okay. facelifts and things. And Nicolas does the whole spectrum of facial plastic surgery, but he's very strong in injectables and minimally invasive So they're getting a fantastic training. So they get- Do they rotate between they the three rotate. of you and a year? So they spend four months with me where they get the full scope of rhinoplasty. They get the ribs, they get the reconstructions, they get the long cases, they get the difficult yeah, yeah, cases. Yeah. Then they go to Bogota and they spend the other eight months in Bogota, four months with Jorge, where they do all of the facial rejuvenation techniques. And then they spend the other four months with Nicolas, where they do everything plus the minimally invasive. So are they Colombians? No, our fellowship is open Really? Uh, to anybody, but they basically, we have one requirement. I mean, it's open to uh, ENTs. Yeah. We're associated with a university in Colombia. So because in Colombia, any educational program, postgraduate program has to have, uh, has to be backed up by a university. Yes. So our program is backed up by university. Mm -hmm. uh, it's under the clinic where I work, which is Clinica in Banaco. Mm -hmm. So we have like, all of the educational uh, support that we need. And then we have, we're an international uh, federation fellowship program. So all of our fellows at the end of the year, they take uh, the, uh, the international board examination yes, yes. and then I'll come to that in a minute. But it's really neat because it's open, not only to Colombians, but also to all of Latin American yeah. and anybody who can speak Spanish because we're in a Spanish speaking country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the requirements is that they do need to speak and write Spanish. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so anybody from Spain could come there, anybody who spoke Spanish could come there. And the first group of fellows, we had 
two people from Colombia and one person from Mexico. And uh, how long have you been doing this program for now? We're in our second year of fellowship. Druxana, this is so exciting because I'm in my first year okay. of having a fellow, but we've got one guy and he is spending most of the time with me, but he's going to go to one of the other South African guys, the second guy ever passed the board exams. And so it's our, we're very excited, but we would love to get to the point of actually having two at a time. So the one guy can be with Dr. Murdoch and one guy with me. Exactly. And that would be fantastic. So that's what they do. I mean, for example, right now I have a fellow with me. Yeah. Then Jorge has his own fellow and Nicolas has his own fellow. And the good thing about that is four months is maybe the right time because not every fellow you're going to get on with. So rather just limit it. You've got four months and then it's new fellow at four months. And then they months. change. But the interesting thing of that is that they go from, for example, I do everything in facial plastic surgery, but I mean, the big chunk of my practice is rhinoplasty. Yes. So I do minimally invasive. I do the other stuff, but I don't do as many facelifts as Jorge does. Yes. So they, they, they you know, so they... They, they're focused for four months seeing the tough cases in rhinoplasty. Then they go to Bogota to Jorge and then they see the tough, you know, all of the yeah. facial rejuvenation cases. And so they get the broad scope. And then the other thing that we do, which I think is really interesting, is that they need to publish at least one scientific paper yes. a year, during yeah. the year, yeah. 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 ideally one every four months. And now we are, with my new fellow, we're doing a very interesting study on the thick skin, and I can tell you a little bit about it. But then the other thing is that every Thursday, we have an academic session, and everybody gets connected uh, on, Zoom on Zoom, on Google Meet, really, and they need to present their topic. You know, So what we do is we take the whole broad, the whole span of topics uh, taken from the programs of facial plastic surgery in the United States. And they basically go from A to Z and they present. So they, it's a one and a half hour academic session where, where they present every time it's a different topic. They have to present this in English because remember that English is not our native language. Yeah, yeah but they're going to be interviewed at in, in English exactly. and write the exams in so they need to make up, uh, you know, they need to organize their presentations in English. They need to present patients in English. They do everything in English. And then every four months, they get, they get an examination, which is a written examination in English and an oral examination with patients in English, real cases. Wow. And so it's a great program you guys are running, hey? Eh? So we, what we're looking for is, and they know that their responsibility, oh, and the other part I do is a little bit of reconstruction. I don't do the huge reconstructions, yeah, yeah. but I do all of the local flaps. So they see the broad spectrum. I mean, there's a few little things they don't see. They don't see craniofacial. They don't see a lot of trauma, but I mean, they know they have to study it. And we review it. I mean, we, during the whole year, so they have 52 topics because the year has 52 weeks. So they have to cover 52 topics. It's, it has been really interesting. The first group of fellows, they sat the board exam this past June. All of them made, uh, you know, uh, it went really well for them. They passed their examination. I mean, and we're very proud of them because, I mean, English is not their native language. Yeah. And for some of them, it was like a very difficult year because, I mean, they were, you know, they were really polishing their English. They were learning how not to freak out in, in front of an interviewer who was interviewing them in English. Yeah, yeah. So it has been a great learning process for everybody. So Roxana, explain to me this whole thing about being recognized international board certified facial plastic surgeon. And those exams are extremely hard. I mean, I remember doing that the first day was two, three hour multiple choice uh, papers. I was absolutely finished. And the next day you have three different examiners asking you four different clinical cases. So it's 12 cases. It's, it's insanely difficult, but why do it? Okay, you know, the real importance of doing it is because facial plastic surgery is very popular worldwide, and tons of people are saying they can do facial plastic surgery. And this was developed for the safety of our patients. Yeah. So we are, what we're trying to do is standardize knowledge. And the gold standard for certification in facial plastic surgery is the American board examination. Yes. 
So what we did was that in 2012, with the International Federation, we created the International Board Certification System. Yeah. And basically what we do is that we use the gold standard for certification in facial plastic surgery, which is the American Board Examination. And that board is offered to all of the international people mm -hmm. who have the qualifications to call themselves facial plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. So that can that's open to uh, plastic surgeons, ENTs, basically, and they need to show an expertise yes. in the field. So it's either they do a fellowship and ideally an international federation fellowship, or they show a series of cases, which yes. is a minimal number of cases saying, look, I'm a, you know, I perform a great load of cases of facial plastic surgery. I want to be board certified. Yes. And today the gold standard uh, for us in certification for facial plastic surgery, we consider that that gold standard is sitting the international Absolutely. board certification. Yeah. It's a tough exam, yeah. but it basically, what it does is that it measures your knowledge in the field of facial, in all of the field of facial plastic surgery. And why do we do this? Basically because we want to be at a better level. Yeah. It's a higher level, yeah. you know, but in the end, it's for the safety of our That's patients. Good. And, you know, what we need to do as specialists is offer our patients the best uh, attention possible okay. in any surgery they're looking for in their face, yeah. awesome. especially the cosmetic and reconstructive procedures. Okay. No, that's cool. That's cool. So it's basically that. And my recommendation is you're interested in facial plastic surgery. You do a good uh, percentage of your practice's facial plastic surgery. You should really be looking at the international yeah. board a certification program in facial plastic surgery. No, 100%. Surgery. I can't agree. Yeah. That's great. You know, Sana, I just exactly. love your energy. You know, it's so nice to chat to you about this stuff. So there's one last thing I want to kind of dig into, which has been, I know for both of us, it's a, it's a kind of a frustrating passion we share in a way, is this whole thing about women's place in facial plastic surgery. Like, so I'm, I'm really interested to kind of share with the listeners some of your thoughts. Like, how can we we help inspire the ladies to do what you've done. I mean, you've been an absolute pioneer, but I don't know. It's, it's something that still frustrates me a lot is that why is there so few ladies in a way? It's so hard to be a mom and a wife and have kids and run the thing. But yeah, you know, just maybe share a little bit about where you're at with well, that. Eh? You know, one of the nice things that we have for this year's fellows is that one of our fellows is a woman oh. and she's not Colombian. She's from Salvador, from Central America. And she's gonna be like one of the few, uh, I mean, she's gonna be the first woman uh, yeah, who, is, who hopefully will be uh, certified in facial plastic surgery in Central America, which wow. I think is gonna be amazing. Wow. But the other thing that's interesting about uh, Gabriela is that she, have, she has a little daughter uh, and uh, so, you know, the big question when we interviewed her was, okay, what are, you know, you have a daughter, because she said, she told us, yeah. I have a daughter, I have a small daughter. Yeah. And uh, her parents are helping her take care of her daughter in her country, which is not Colombia. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a tough decision. Wow. And, uh, and so she, she comes and goes, I mean, but it's, it's, you know, for women, I think women, women have to be, we, we get in Colombia, we get a lot of women in the specialty of otolaryngology, yeah. but women reach a point where when they have kids, they need to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really feel that one needs to have all of the backing up of some sort of a structure that can help you get yeah. through. Yeah. That's, that can be either your husband or your partner or whatever. Uh, you know, that person needs to understand what exactly you're doing. Then this thing of the role models, that, that has really changed. Mm. And with the pandemic, it dramatically changed. Mm. So, you know, women today in many parts are not supposed to stay home raising kids and cooking. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, women yeah. today, you know, uh, they, they share the roles. And what I always tell a woman when they ask me is, there's always this guilty feeling, yeah. you know, 
Uh, I'm leaving my kids. You know, I've got two boys. They're grown up now, but I'm still a mom. I connect every single day with them. We have a family chat. I mean, uh, cell phones have become amazing because we see each other. We have lunch together and one is in one country and I'm in another country and we chat and we connect. And, uh, but basically I feel that the role models have changed and women need to get to have clear that, I mean, uh, you know, they need to understand that we need help yeah. if we're going to have kids. But I mean, kids are not only the responsibility of the woman, yeah. you know, they're the responsibility of there's a father. They're also the responsibility of the parents and hopefully they'll have a family backing them up. Yeah. And so I, I really feel that makes life a lot easier. And it's still a lot. It takes up a lot for women to go forward uh, and to be there. Because, I mean, for example, I have a 93-year-old mom. Wow. And she has been, you know, she hasn't been well. And I'm the only one in Colombia. So I work a full day. Then I get home. I see my husband. I say hello. We have dinner. And I go up because she lives in the same building where I live to say hello to my mom. And uh, so I'm constantly kind of doing many things, maybe a lot of things. I put a lot of pressure on myself and I think it's a little bit tougher. But but then on the other hand, you know, I have never stopped doing what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. My real passion, which was facial plastic surgery. And then the other, my new passion, which is really developing our institute, which is called the Face and Nose Institute, which is an institute that we set up with Nicolás and Jorge to promote high quality education in facial plastic surgery. And we're setting up courses in Colombia, which are top notch courses focused in facial plastic surgery. So we have three courses a year just to close it up. And I deviated from the topic, but I really wanted to talk about the Face and Nose Institute because we have one course in rhinoplasty, one course in facial rejuvenation techniques, and one course in minimally invasive procedures. Yes. And we're, so all of these courses are linked with cadaver dissection labs, and we take topics and it's an in-depth experience for the people. And it's like two or three days of just focusing on something, but top level. Yes. And that has been so exciting, Cameron, you cannot imagine. I mean, I'm learning so much. So you know, and this is like a long-term project. So I say, you know, I picture myself and I say, okay, you know, when I'm 80, if I still have the energy, you know, I can still teach. I mean, yeah. I can still give and return a little bit of all of the things that I have received yeah. over the years. So what do I tell women? Don't give up. I mean, just organize yourself. Yes. Have your priorities, you know, in place. What does that mean? I mean, you're, you're kind of looking at me. I mean, you don't need to buy a new car every two years. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you want to spend your money in? Me as a mom, having the proper people around you, helping you take care of your family if you have a family. Yeah. If you don't want a family, okay, great. You're yeah. on your own, you know, it's easier. Yeah. But if you have kids, if you have a family, you need to have the setup so that things can function and you can do, you can focus in other things also. That doesn't mean not being a mom. You need to be there if you want to yeah. be a mom. But I mean, you can also have people helping you yeah. so that you can be the best mom in the world and the best physician in the world and the best specialist in the world, you know? It's like... <laughs> oh, Rixman, I'm hanging off every word you say, man. It's so nice. Eh? Yo. Well, you know, I, you know, I try, you know, it's like... And then <laughs> one last thing, because I know you need to close, but we have we made up a graduation for our fellows. Our own, the Face and Nose Institute made a, a graduation. And, and it was really interesting because we have developed this little club, which is called the Face and Nose Club. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is we want to create a community in facial plastic surgery within that is going to group our fellows. And, and we want them to be part of the family of Face and Nose. So it's another family. It's another type of family. And so we're, we're going to do one boot camp every year, which is one whole day, maybe a weekend, where we're going to be concentrating and basically spending time with the people that have spent time with us, seeing, you know, exploring new projects, 
knowing what they're up to, trying to help them out in their different uh, you know, projects that they can have, but also showing them what's going on in the specialty mm -hmm. and they showing us what's going on in the specialty mm -hmm. for them. And one of the, the lecture I gave, I spoke about the future of facial plastic surgery, what I thought, but then I spoke about something that with which I want to finish this, and that is happiness. And that is Ikigai. What is Ikigai? Ikigai was the first time I heard about Ikigai. I heard it from Grant Hamilton. And I took a picture of the slide. I went back home and I started reading about it. And it's really interesting because they have these communities around the world which are called blue zones. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, there's one in Italy, there's one in Costa Rica, there's one in the States, there's one in Japan. And there's communities of very old people who have lived very well their lives and uh, they're 90s, 100, and you know, people have studied them to try and define, you know, what has been their secret to their longevity. Mm. And it has, you know, it's a combination of things, but one of them is being able to hopefully know what you're passionate about. Being able to do what your passion is and hopefully be reimbursed for it. Mm -hmm. But then also being, you know, it has to do with happiness. Mm -hmm. It has to do with waking up in the morning and opening the window and saying, wow, this is such a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm so blessed to be here. Mm -hmm. And going down the stairs and maybe running into the newspaper man and being able to say to that person, Good morning, what a beautiful day this is. Yeah. And those little things are, you know, things that make us, our living, you know, our treading through life a lot nicer. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think it has an impact in how we feel, how we age, and what we transmit to others. And, and I'm really working in that area. And so I gave it to them and they're like thinking, you know, they were kind of looking at me and I said, you know, we all have to find our Ikigai. And our Ikigai does not have to be this very huge, sophisticated project. It can be something very stupid, very small. Yeah. But you know, it's how can we give something back to the people who are around us, yeah. you know, to make them feel better. Yeah. And then one of the secrets of all of these blue zones is that all of these people get together, they're still working, and what they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So they're useful. They interact socially. They're happy. Yeah. And that makes all the difference in the world when we're aging. And we're all, we're all getting there. I mean, we're all going to get old. We're all going to mm -hmm. die. You know, and I don't know if I necessarily want to sit down in my home to watch TV and not do anything. I mean, I cannot picture myself doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on my key. I, you need to, I mean, I think you pretty much have it figured out. But yeah, you're, uh, <laughs> no, but uh, this is, we can learn so much from each other. And it's like, no, right, Roxana, it's, it's just lovely to chat to you. I really, it's... So I kind of run through different things. Maybe you ran over here and over No, there, but this but is honest. I think this is one of the sp most special episodes I've ever recorded. And I think uh, the listeners appreciate it. Eh? So guys, thanks, eh? Thanks for listening. No. And... Um, Come back next week. And Roxana, thank you so much. No. And I hope, you know, honestly, you have to be in Cartagena. Cartagena is going to be magical. Yeah. We we'll see you guys in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> cool, guys. Thanks very much. Eh? For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests. Mm -hmm.